my darlings. This video idea came to me in a dream. Every Peter Pan adaptation ranked! Kind of. As a kid, I think that everybody had one thing they just would not shut up about. You know, for you it might have been Pokemon or Bionicles or horses. For me, it was Peter Pan. I was obsessed with Peter Pan. And over the years, I have been gifted many a Peter Pan thing. Uh, this was a gift from my aunt and uncle. He was gifted to me when I was way too young to appreciate the fact that he's mint in the box. This poster is from my parents. Uh, this bracelet is from a different aunt and uncle. This little porcelain guy was also a gift. And then when I was two, so 1994, Four. Um, I got this little guy at Disney World. I held him in my sweaty, sticky little baby hand all day, and somehow I did not lose him. Um, and then, ooh, okay, all right. So I don't know if this is still a thing, but on a different trip to Disney, uh, when I was young and dinosaurs roamed the earth, you could go to King Stefan's castle, and inside there would be like a Disney animator, and you could ask them to draw a picture for you. And, you know who I asked him to draw? A Dumbo. I'm just kidding. It was Peter Pan. So yeah, I love Peter Pan. Peter Pan as a character has existed for over a hundred years, which means that there are countless adaptations, and I really mean countless. Like, I think it's impossible to actually sift through every single one, and that's not even counting, like, songs that mention, like, Neverland or Peter Pan or Captain Hook. That doesn't include things that are just kind of, like, used as metaphors, you know, it's, it's like Alice in Wonderland. If, if a property is old enough, it just kind of becomes its own, like, cultural icon that's just recognizable to anybody. I'm really going to stick to just adaptations that I could get my hands on, things that I think were, like, culturally relevant or important, just anything that I thought was interesting, and I invite you to join me on this adventure. We're gonna watch them, we're gonna review them, and then we're gonna rank them. So before we can get into the adaptations, we need to talk about the original canon. And to do that, we need to start with The Little White Bird. The Little White Bird is a book by J.M. Barrie, published in 1902. The novel follows the narrator, an English bachelor who, despite having no family of his own, becomes emotionally involved in the lives of a few families in the London area, including a woman named Mary and her six-year-old son David, and William, the waiter at his club, and his wife Irene and their children. Although it has that sort of childish whimsy that Barry is known for, the narrator is a crotchety old man, constantly complaining or viewing the people around him by what he perceives to be their most negative or frivolous traits. Like David's father has a laugh that annoys him, or the waiter at his club isn't very good at his job. But despite his aloof attitude, he is very doting to the children he meets and even defends the adults he encounters behind their backs. Of course, behind their backs, like, it's not like he likes you or anything. Ugh, abaka. The narrator, who regards himself as sort of an outside observer to the experience around him, tends to talk about women and mothers in a very idealistic sort of way. Like, even though Mary doesn't have a lot of money, she's able to redo and remodel her home and the objects within. The book also contains some romanticized supernatural elements, like the speculation that all ghosts must be mothers coming back to check on their children. He really talks about women like we're magical. And we are. What with the selling our souls to Satan and all. Mary also seems interested in observing familial relationships, particularly mothers, and sometimes the semi-familial presence of governesses, which I also think about a lot because I'm a nanny. So if you've never read the book before, I'm not going to say much else because those are just the non-Peter-centric elements that I felt like talking about. While the narrator, being an adult, obviously knows where babies come from, his tiny companion David asserts that all children begin as birds in Kensington Gardens. And the reason that there are bars on nursery windows is to keep little ones who think that they can still fly from jumping out and flying away. He also believes that the reason that childless women sit in parks feeding birds is to try and catch one of them and take them home. Even in this book for adults, Barry is very enchanted by childish understandings of the world and in creating phrases that have their own little humor to them. Like at one point he's talking to David's father while David is still a baby, and the text reads that he listened coldly while he told, told me, me what David did when you told him his toes were pigs going to market, or returning from it, I forget which. Anyways, yes I'm from the south, yes I have debutante gloves. Like, comment, and subscribe if you were raised in a culture that fetishized your virginity. But anyways, here's my second edition copy of The Little White Bird. While I could talk about literature and themes all day, we really need to focus on Peter. 
who is first mentioned in chapter 13. In chapter 13, the narrator takes you, the reader, on a mental tour of Kensington Gardens as he walks with David, noting points of interest like trees kids like to sit under, or an area very densely populated by nannies with strollers during the day. The first mention of Peter is when he's talking about a lake called the Serpentine, which is a real lake at the boundary of Hyde Park and Kensington Gardens, and states that in the lake there is a small island where all birds who later become children are born. According to the narrator, no one who is human can reach the island except for Peter, who is half-human, and sails across the lake in a bird nest. The chapter continues with the narrator and David kind of doing their own thing, and it isn't until the next chapter that everybody else is put aside and we focus exclusively on Peter. Chapter 14. Peter Pan. Peter, as he is described in The Little White Bird, is a baby who, when he was one week old, flew out of his nursery, still thinking he was a bird, and flew back to Kensington Gardens. But once he got to the island, he was made aware that he was no longer a bird, and therefore could no longer fly. The reason he could fly before was because he believed he could, but now he doesn't. So he can't. If there was ever a metaphor for limiting yourself because of self-doubt, like, this is it. Later in Peter and Wendy, he's described as being kind of like young, but school-aged with all of his baby teeth, so like, maybe six? Also, this is different from the later canon, where it says that Peter ran away the day he was born, specifically because he didn't want to grow up. Also, also, in The Little White Bird, he is seven days old, and yet he can, like, walk and talk. I mean, I was going to write that, you know, I'm a nanny, so I know a thing or two about babies, but, like, you don't have to be an expert to know that a seven-day-old baby can't talk. Like, I, I, you know what? It, it's fine. It's a fictional book. Barry can do whatever he wants. Um, a childhood development? Who is she? I don't know her. You know, I'm ranking adaptations partially based on accuracy. Should I deduct points from Barry for being inconsistent in his own canon? So anyways, Peter flies away from home as a half-human, half-bird. Not physically, but in the sense that because he returned to Bird Island after transforming from a bird into a human, he's sort of stuck between these two experiences. Solomon, the wise old bird in charge of the island, takes Peter under his wing and feeds him bread that the other birds gather for him from the gardens. Solomon is also the one who gives Peter his iconic pipe of reeds. Basically, Peter is doomed to be stuck on this island forever, until chapter 15, The Thrush's Nest. Shelley, a poet, walking around Kensington Gardens, gets bored and decides to make a paper boat out of a banknote and set it across the lake. You know, normal things that we adults do all the time. The paper boat eventually makes its way to the island where Peter and the birds live and the birds take the notes to Solomon to read. Earlier it's mentioned that because the island on the lake is where all babies come from, sometimes women will write letters asking for a baby and set it out on the water. So Solomon tries to read the banknote, doesn't understand what it's asking for, and decides it's useless, so he just hands it off to Peter to play with. But then, the purpose of the note is understood, at least the most that it can be understood by a literal baby and some birds, and a brilliant scheme is hatched uh, to get Peter off the island. Peter and Solomon hire some thrushes, a type of bird, to build a big nest that Peter can use as a boat to sail across the lake. In compensation for their work, Peter and Solomon cut up the banknote and use the cut-up pieces of paper to represent six pence for a day's worth of work. It's 2020, y'all! Multi-level marketing is out! Scamming birds is in! And eventually, it works. The nest is a success. The nest is a success. Say that three times fast. The nest is a success. The nest is a success. The... <laughs> Why did I write that? and Peter sails across the lake to live among the fairies in the garden, who only come out at night after the gates are locked, and during the day, he sails back to the island so no one can see him. In the following text, we learn all about the fairies, like where they live and how they dress, and then we get the famous line. When the first baby laughed for the first time, his laugh broke into a million pieces and they all went skipping about. That was the beginning of fairies. After living in the gardens for some time, Peter is told by the Queen of the Fairies that she can grant him a wish, and he wants to be able to fly. His wish is granted, and he flies around the city, then back to his house, where he finds the window open and his mother asleep. Peter, you know, being a baby, decides he doesn't want to stay, and that he'll come back another time. But when that other time rolls around, the window is barred, and his mother has a new baby. Another story in these chapters is about his interactions with Mamie a little girl who gets lost in the gardens at night. She wakes up in a little house that the fairies build around her, and Peter is there to have a conversation with her that mirrors his conversation with Wendy in the nursery we'll see later, where he's offered a kiss, doesn't know what that means, holds out his hand, and the girl, trying not to embarrass him, gives him a thimble. To thank Peter for helping her, Mamie gives her toy goat to the fairies, who turns it into a real one, which Peter apparently rides around on at night in search of lost children. There's a lot of childish whimsy here, but then it starts to mingle with that old school fairy tale morbidity, where we learn that if Peter doesn't find a lost child in time, they will freeze to death and die. Whereupon, Peter will dig them a little grave and make a little tombstone with their initials on it. 
Like, no offense, people in London, but what the hell? It's 7 p.m. Do you know where your children are? Hopefully not in the deadly public park. Also, as a quick side note, while I was looking for footage of Kensington Gardens for earlier in the video, I came across this channel called Jewel's Guides, where this guy just shows you really cool places in London to visit, and he actually had an explanation for those little stones that I didn't know about before. So, uh, take it away, dude. And uh, once you notice them, you'll probably see them all over the place. Oh, there they are over there. They're supposed to be tombstones, according to the original Peter Pan story. Did you know that? I did. No, I think it had a really good, good story. They're not actually gravestones. They're actually parish boundary markers. He says, I think that quite the most touching sight in the gardens is the two tombstones of Walter Stephen Matthews and Phoebe Phelps. So you can see on this one, it says WSM, which is Walter Stephen Matthews in the book. But in actual fact, it's supposed to mean Westminster St. Margaret, which is the parish in that direction. And around this side, it says PP, which is Phoebe Phelps in the book, or is actually Parish of Paddington, which is everything over in that direction. I mean, obviously I'm an American. I've never been to London or Kensington Gardens, so I didn't know that these stones actually existed. So yeah, I think that's pretty cool. To keep things short, we're gonna end our discussion of The Little White Bird here, where Peter leaves the story. And however much I would recommend this to read, um, if all you care about is your boy, what with the not growing up, in 1906, an abridged version called Peter Pan in Kensington Gardens was published, which is basically just chapters 13 through 18. I have also linked below to chapter 13 of The Little White Bird audiobook, which is here on YouTube. So, if you're interested, take it or leave it. So now that we've talked about the origins of Peter Pan, we can talk about the stage play.